Hi, my name is Katie Lee Huang, and welcome back to the GI Lecture Series. We are now going to focus on GI pharmacology. As most of you have probably suffered either a GI bug or acute food poisoning at some point in your lives and wanted it to go away, I'm sure you can already guess that GI pharmacology is fairly important. I know GI has been a pretty long chapter, so let's finish up the last bit and pass on through. Here you have an excellent diagram demonstrating the site of action of most of the drugs we are about to discuss, so it's important to note this in your notes. A lot of the drugs we've already talked about in the previous lectures. We will now refer to this diagram as we talk about the individual drug classes, and this will help keep it all cemented. The first class we'll talk about are the H2 blockers, or the histamine H2 receptor blockers, and these are an important class of medications. You are likely to confuse them with the histamine H1 receptor antagonists, so a mnemonic that can help you remember these H2 blockers is table for two, since H2 blockers are the GI drugs you would use for eating. Also, there's the mnemonic Take H2 blockers before you dine, to recall the suffix dine that is common to all the drugs. We have four drugs to mention, cimetidine, ranitidine, famotidine, and nizatidine. These all work by reversibly antagonizing H2 receptors, which results in decreased acid secretion from parietal cells which you can see here working in the diagram. This also reduces the effects of other substances that induce acid secretion from parietal cells, such as gastrin and acetylcholine. Clinically, these are used for peptic ulcers, gastritis, and mild esophageal reflux. So if they help prevent esophageal reflux, what precancerous state would they also prevent? That's right. Barrett esophagus. It's really important to know side effects for the various drugs. Especially important is cimetidine. Cimetidine in particular has a number of toxicities. It is a potent P450 inhibitor, has antiandrogenic effects, causes confusion, dizziness, and headaches upon crossing the blood-brain barrier, and also crosses the placenta. Along with ranitidine, it can decrease creatinine excretion. The other drugs in this class do not share these effects. The PPIs, as we discussed during the physiology section, are really excellent drugs because they inhibit the single exit route for acid, instead of blocking one of several routes that stimulates the parietal cell. Remember, the parietal cells are located here in the stomach and secrete acid into the lumen. Which pump do the PPIs inhibit? That's right, it irreversibly inhibits the hydrogen potassium ATPase, which you can see here. By inhibiting this proton pump, the acid is stopped being pumped into the stomach lumen. Examples include omeprazole, lansoprazole, ezomeprazole, pantoprazole, and dexlansoprazole. They also have minimal side effects and are available in a variety of formulations. They are used in peptic ulcer, gastritis, esophageal reflux, and the Zollinger-Ellison syndrome. It is important to note that they have some toxicity, including increased risk of C. diff infection and pneumonia. Long-term use can cause fractures, such as of the hip, wrist, and spine. A decrease in serum magnesium can also be found. Peptic ulcer treatment usually involves treatment with three drugs. This triple therapy includes a PPI, plus clarithromycin, and amoxicillin. However, it can include metronidazole if the patient is penicillin allergic. Bismuth and sucralfate have a physical mechanism in which they bind to the ulcer base. This provides a physical barrier that allows bicarbonate secretion to reestablish the necessary pH gradient, which you can see here. They are used to increase ulcer healing and traveler's diarrhea, also known in some circles as Montezuma's Revenge. 
Misoprostol is a prostaglandin E1 analog. Why are NSAIDs harmful to the stomach? Well, NSAIDs block the production of prostaglandins and thereby harm the gastric lining. In order to prevent this, you can give synthetic prostaglandins along with NSAIDs when NSAID therapy is needed in order to limit the harm to the stomach. Misopristol increases the production and secretion of the gastric mucus barrier, which you can see here. And it also reduces acid secretion. We'll get to this a little bit later, but another way to circumvent the GI side effects of NSAIDs is to give a selective COX-2 inhibitor, such as celecoxib, which leaves the gastric mucus unaffected. Let's do a little bit more review. Separately, this same drug is also used in the case of a patent ductus arteriosus. Because the prostaglandin keeps the PDA open, it can be used to induce labor as it causes uterine contractions and thinning of the cervix. The major side effect is diarrhea, and it is also contraindicated in women who might be pregnant or might become pregnant because it is an abortifacient. A woman with rheumatoid arthritis was recently started on misopristol because of adverse effects of her arthritis medicine. What is the adverse effect and the medication that caused it? The most likely adverse effect is peptic ulcers induced by NSAIDs. Remember, as we just talked about, NSAIDs block the production of prostaglandins through inhibition of COX-1 and COX-2 enzymes. While this is good for rheumatoid arthritis, this hurts the stomach lining since prostaglandins normally act on parietal cells to inhibit stomach acid secretion. The next drug we'll talk about is octreotide. Octreotide is a synthetic form of somatostatin and is a more potent inhibitor of growth hormone, glucagon, and insulin. It inhibits many hormones such as gastrin, growth hormone, CCK, glucagon, insulin, secretin, and VIP. It reduces GI motility and inhibits contraction of the gallbladder. Octreotide also reduces secretion of intestinal secretions, causes vasoconstriction of blood vessels, and reduces portal vessel pressures in bleeding varices. From these effects, it can thus be determined that it's used to treat acute variceal bleeds, acromegaly, VIPoma, and carcinoid tumors. Again, it's important to remember its side effects. Side effects are nausea, hypothyroidism, and GI reactions such as cramps and steatorrhea. Okay, let's talk a little bit now about antacid use. There are three typical antacids, aluminum hydroxide, magnesium hydroxide, and calcium carbonate. Use of antacids alters gastric and urinary pH, and it delays gastric emptying. This can affect the absorption, bioavailability, or urinary excretion of other drugs. Each antacid has its own set of side effects when it's overused. For example, aluminum hydroxide causes constipation, hypophosphatemia, proximal muscle weakness, osteodystrophy, and potentially seizures. Magnesium hydroxide causes diarrhea, hyporeflexia, hypotension, and less commonly cardiac arrest. Calcium carbonate is milder, with the only side effects being hypercalcemia, as you would expect, and a rebound increase in acid when their use is halted. In addition, all of these agents can cause hypokalemia. Another commonly used class of drugs in treatment of chronic constipation are the osmotic laxatives. They exert their function by creating an osmotic load in the gut lumen to draw water out. There are a few notable examples, which include magnesium hydroxide, magnesium citrate, polyethylene glycol, and lactulose. The last of these, lactulose, is particularly important since it can be used to treat hepatic encephalopathy. 
since gut flora degrade it into metabolites that promote nitrogen excretion as ammonium ions. However, since most of these work via an osmotic mechanism, side effects most notably include diarrhea and dehydration. In those that abuse these drugs, harmful electrolyte abnormalities can result. Can you think of a GI microbe that causes a similar situation? That's right, cholera can also cause an osmotic diarrhea, which can lead to an electrolyte depletion. Okay, let's do one more flash quiz. A patient who heavily self-medicates her GERD complains of dizziness and diarrhea. Which antacid is she likely overusing? That's right, it's magnesium hydroxide. One way to help you remember this is the M and G can help you think must go. Hence, magnesium hydroxide can cause diarrhea. Next, let's talk about sulfazalazine. Sulfazalazine can be used in Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, and rheumatoid arthritis, similar to infliximab. It is a combination of sulfapyridine, which has an antibacterial effect, and 5-ASA, which is anti-inflammatory. It is activated in the GI tract by colonic bacteria and provides some topical anti-inflammatory relief. Side effects of sulfazalazine include malaise, nausea, sulfatoxicity, and oligospermia that is reversible. Next, let's talk about ondansetron. Ondansetron is a medication you will become quite familiar with in the hospital as is used to control nausea and vomiting. It's a 5-HT3 receptor antagonist and acts centrally to prevent vomiting. It is used postoperatively for patients undergoing chemo and also in many other situations. Side effects include headache and constipation. One good mnemonic to help you remember the main use of ondansetron is that its anti-emetic effects help you to keep on dancing. Metoclopramide is a receptor D2 antagonist, which works to increase the resting tone, contractility, lower esophageal sphincter tone, and motility of the stomach. It belongs to a family of drugs known as prokinetics. It does not influence the colon transport time. Metoclopramide is useful in diabetic and post-surgery gastroparesis. Remember, this drug is a D2 antagonist, just like another very important class of drugs, the typical antipsychotics. Since it blocks D2 receptors, it has many of the same extrapyramidal side effects as the typicals, which you will hear about more in the psychiatry lectures. However, most notably, metoclopramide can have Parkinsonian effects and can cause restlessness, drowsiness, fatigue, depression, nausea, and diarrhea. It has often been implicated as the cause of tardive dyskinesia, a form of dyskinesia that occurs after long-term use of antipsychotic drugs and is characterized by repetitive involuntary movements such as lip smacking and pursing of the lips. Speaking of Parkinson's and antipsychotics, these drugs' relationship to metoclopramide is a good example of a larger concept in pharmacology, which involves being careful about giving multiple drugs that alter the same pathways or act on the same receptors. Another good example of this concept is avoiding giving multiple drugs that cause vasodilation, such as nitroglycerin and erectile dysfunction drugs, because their additive effects can lead to a huge drop in blood pressure. Metoclopramide also has an interaction with digoxin and certain diabetic agents. Metoclopramide is contraindicated in patients with small bowel obstruction, since you would never want to have increased kinetic forces against an obstructed bowel. We'll finish this video lecture by discussing Orlistat. 
Orlistat was designed to treat obesity and it directly inhibits the lipases of the pancreas and stomach. By inhibiting lipase, fats are unable to be broken down and absorbed. This, though, as you can imagine, can cause the side effect of steatorrhea and decreased absorption of fat-soluble vitamins, which are what? That's right, it's vitamins A, D, E, and K. Let's do a question now to solidify what we've learned. A 54-year-old woman with long-standing type 2 diabetes suffers from peripheral neuropathy and delayed gastric emptying. After many months of treatment for these symptoms, she begins to develop strange, involuntary repetitive movements in her face that do not cease when she stops her medication. Which is the mechanism of action of the medication she most likely takes? Is it A, decreases lower esophageal sphincter tone, B, decreases transit time through the colon, C, increases resting tone, D, increases transit time through the colon, or E, increases upper esophageal sphincter tone? Well, the correct answer is C, increases resting tone. The patient is taking metoclopramide for gastroparesis, which is associated with diabetes mellitus. Remember, metoclopramide is a D2 receptor antagonist that is used as a prokinetic agent. How does it work? Well, it increases resting tone, contractility, lower esophageal tone, and motility. However, it does not affect transit time through the colon. The USMLE loves to test on common side effects, so her having strange, involuntary repetitive movements likely is due to the extrapyramidal symptoms, such as dystonia and Parkinsonism. The onset of these symptoms warrant immediate cessation of the metoclopramide. All right, everyone, that's it for the GI lectures. Thanks for listening.